Hi, my name is Ari Morin. I'm a program manager at Ritual and a mom of an 18 month old son named Miles. I'm really excited to be with these two um, lactation experts to talk about um, breastfeeding basics. So I'd like to get started by um, having Corky and Jennifer introduce themselves. So my name's Corky Harvey. Um, uh, as you can see, my initials there, I'm an I'm RN. I have a master's degree in maternal newborn nursing, and I've been an, uh, a lactation consultant uh, for 35 years. Uh, I'm an IBCLC, as is Jennifer. That means internationally board certified lactation consultant. I'm the co-founder of a place in West Los Angeles in Hollywood called the Pump Station and Nurtury. Uh, that's a breastfeeding and new parent center uh, that we've been been there for a long time now, seeing uh, families and moms, babies breastfeeding. So uh, I also was the first lactation consultant um, on the West Side. I was at UCLA Santa Monica and started their lactation program. Also taught for the UCLA lactation consulting program. So it's kind of my life. Breasts are kind of my life is what I always say. Um, so uh, Jennifer, it's your turn. Hi, my name is Jennifer Lezak. I am a mother to two boys, eight and 10, who are now home for the foreseeable future. So I'm juggling that along with my job. I work at Kaiser on Sunset as a lactation consultant, inpatient, and uh, mostly you can find me in their outpatient lactation clinic. I've been a lactation consultant for over 10 years now. And I actually went to the pump station, Corky, when I had my baby. And Good. yeah, I didn't know anyone when I was pregnant. And I went there mostly to meet new moms and make friends. And I'm still friends with those ladies today. So it's, it's a great place you have there that Thank really you. provides a sense of community for people in Los Angeles. Thank you. And um, I still am friends with the women I was with in my original little play group. But it was called yeah. a play group at that time. I forgot to mention my mother of three breastfed adults. And I have two little grandsons and they happen to live in Germany, but my daughter is an OT, an occupational therapist, and took her lactation educator as well, nursed her babies for two and a half years and showed a lot of people and shared with a lot of people there. So that was a proud moment for me that she kind of followed that, that path. So that's nice. Um, yeah, so you can find me mostly at Kaiser. I do have my own private practice where I was doing, you know, in-home consults now move to virtual. I also teach classes out of Loom, which is over sort of in mid-city here in Los Angeles. Also migrated on to virtual classes now as well. Um, but thanks for hosting us. Well, I'm really excited to be having this conversation. Um, I was, as I mentioned, a mom of an 18 month old. I had a really hard time breastfeeding. Um, I was successful in nursing for about six-ish weeks. And then I moved into doing exclusive pumping. So he was like nine, 10 months. Um, so it was definitely a journey for me. And I'm excited to hear about how I could maybe get up on the right foot next time. So on that note, um, I'd love to start on kind of the beginning, beginning. Um, do you have any suggestions, advice, recommendations for what moms can do um, before they've given birth to prepare for breastfeeding? I would start with education. And so research shows that the most important thing about being successful is your intention to do so. Um, but add to that the educational piece, which um, with your partner or your mother or whoever can be supportive of you, taking a really good breastfeeding class, you know, that's gone virtual for us too. I'm teaching that. Um, and it's, it's, it's different, but it's still incredible. It, what's different is that Zoom doesn't allow the kind of conversational give and take that you get in a classroom setting, but it's still, we're doing pretty well. So taking that class with your partner, if your partner does not know about breastfeeding, then that person can't be as helpful. So the more the partners and the family surrounding you know, the better. So I, we teach a three hour class and uh, I could go on till midnight on those classes. There's so much to know, but people can only take so much. So getting prepared with information is a first big step. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. Taking a prenatal breastfeeding class is one of the most helpful ways to get you off on the right foot. Without the knowledge of what to expect in those first few weeks, you're kind of just left wondering, is this normal? What's going on here? I also really suggest getting a breast exam, either by your OB or your midwife or whoever's your healthcare professional, knowing kind of the challenges you might face 
before you have the baby can help you, you know, down the right path once baby comes and you're not sort of feeling like, oh, I'm already, I'm already behind the game because of my, you know, my anatomy might be challenging. And just along with that piece of, you know, you may not need the pump at the beginning, but certainly you should look at your insurance options before the baby comes. What pump am I being offered? What's the best pump that my insurance will cover? How can I get it? Can I get it pre-baby? You know, just to have it ready in case you need it when you get home so you're not scrambling or you needing to go rent a pump somewhere, which is pretty difficult right now because stores are not really open. We're open. We're okay. running. We're yeah, I refer everybody to you. Thank but, you. So using your you know, use your insurance. You're entitled to a breast pump under the Affordable Care Act. Figure out how to get it, what the best pumps offered for you. Get the pump and open it up. Look at it ask one of us give us a call we'll i'll put my number up you can call the pump station you can call jennifer ask us of your choices which one might be the best because we actually do have information on that and yeah. we a lot of really less than stellar pumps they are not created equal another quick thing i was going to add in like pre-baby if you know friends have them set up a meal train anything to make your transition home so you just can focus you and your partner on the baby getting breastfeeding off on the right foot without worrying about all the other stuff that goes along with the day and, and, and know where your lactation help might be yeah. Get, uh, ask and ask your friends ask your pediatrician uh you know find out who who in your neighborhood area could maybe lend a hand at lactation informationally. And you know, it's different in this COVID era, but um, still that we're out there, we will talk to you, come to the support group. I do support groups Tuesday and Wednesday and the moms just love it. And I love it. It keeps me feeling um, as if I have purpose and uh, helping moms breastfeed at this time is even more important than ever before. And it's, it's harder. I think it's harder. Yeah. I would agree. It's a call out to have those resources in advance. I like specifically remember emailing a, a lactation consultant at like three in the morning crying. Um, so I feel like if I had that um, <laughs> set up before, I would have uh, avoided that one. Um, on the similar note, the um, registries and like all these different stores have a million different like gizmos and gadgets to support um, breastfeeding, like pillows and nipple shields and on and on. Um, is there any like things that you recommend that moms have just on hand before you get going? I would say just the pump that's offered from their insurance, if they could get that on hand. I'm a person that is like less. You don't need to buy all this stuff pillows from your bed are probably going to be great. I mean, you really just need a comfortable place, your baby, you know, that's about it for me. Corky might have some other ideas. Not, not much. Um, I nurse three children with no nursing pillow. Right. <laughs> and um, I do have a favorite nursing pillow if somebody asks me. I like the Luna Lullaby and I like, I like this little guy called Little Something because it, oh, yeah. it fits in a glider and uh, but I don't think you need to spend money on that if, uh, you know, at the pump station, we're struggling as, as everybody is to stay open. So go ahead and buy six. But um, truthfully and honestly, no, um, I like nipple cream. I like, the, I like to use it inside the tunnel of the pump. Um, I brought some gizmos here. I like to put it down this tunnel because it makes it slide nicer, more nicely. But you know, there's not, I speak evidence-based as I'm sure Jennifer does, and there isn't really evidence-based information to support that, but um, occasionally we use the soothing gel pads or something like that, but do they need that stuff at home to begin with? Yeah, no. And nipple shields hopefully would be put on by the hospital lactation consultants if there's a, a need to do that, um, as they're looking at that baby's mouth, et cetera, and seeing what's going on. And we do see, we're seeing even more use of nipples right now, Jennifer, are you as well? I yeah. agree. Yeah. We have people showing up at the hospital with nipple shields and I say, well, wh why did you bring that? Oh, my cousin told me I needed it. And I'm like, yeah. no, 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 you don't. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you do, hopefully the lactation consultants will catch it. However, women are leaving the hospital at a very rate and 
so sometimes you might miss that lactation consultant and, and they are helpful at times honestly but um not ahead of time necessarily so yeah good question. yeah and maybe maybe if you had that prenatal breast exam that might be something that could that might come up so you would know ahead of time you know yep. but sure. really i always just say you need your baby and your boobs so what and your attitude your attitude of stick to it till you get it yeah. which is meant by the intention as well um and uh yeah that's what you need that and because how many women say as you did to me Ari, even before jennifer came on that breastfeeding is hard in many cases i don't want people to think it always is because it isn't always for everybody but there's so many women on my support groups that have struggled in some way um so i i don't ever like to stand in front of a class and say you know it's just like maybe here and they jump on blah blah if there's more to it than that and uh so yeah that attitude of stick to it till you get it find the help until you get it right and usually usually we can help with almost all problems and issues and i know are you had a, a tough experience but my god were you successful in a little bit of a different way maybe but that's incredible your intention was so good and your attitude yeah you pumping for that long is amazing that's amazing that's harder work than than anything. When people I tell me I, I exclusively pumped for a year, I'm like, you need a prize. We need to like give you an award for doing that. I'm hoping this combo helps me next time. I want to be able to like actually do it. Um, and you will do it in a different way. But. And you will. Um, so what can new moms expect when they breastfeed for the first time? Like, will it always hurt? When's the first time that they do it? How does the milk? come in that sort of thing i mean your body starts making milk around like 16 weeks of pregnancy so you're already making milk by the time you're giving birth you may not see it it may not be expressible but that doesn't mean it's not there usually if you're having a hospital birth uh, you'll get a really good feeding in that first five or six hours and the nurses in pretty much every hospital, certainly here in LA, are all trained in positioning and latching. They're gonna help you get that first breastfeeding session in while you're probably in labor and delivery. So that's a great time to get off on the right foot. Now, it probably isn't gonna hurt the first time, right? Um, but going forward over maybe the next 24 hours, you're probably gonna be sore sensitive tender that's all normal i always say you haven't had someone sucking on your nipples for so long you know so even your shirt grazing you can be like very sensitive um but it people say well they told me it wouldn't hurt and i'm like well <laughs> you know it shouldn't you have cracking and bleeding but certainly i would expect hypersensitivity tenderness redness happening yes um tenderness um, if they do a close-up of everybody's nipple two days in, there's probably some slight abrasion on everyone's uh, face of their nipple. But to have it excruciating, I thought, I call it a breath catcher. It's like, whoa! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and then, and then a minute or two in, it feels different and okay. It does feel like pull tug, which for some more sensitive breasted nipple moms might be uncomfortable for them, but they usually get used to it. And if you can't tolerate it for a feeding till you get to somebody, do a little pumping instead until you get yourself uh, going. Or nurse on the breast that's less sore more and pump the other one. And just until you get the help you need. Because most of the time, it is the latch that's not correct. I mean, there's, it, there's tongue tie and high palates and um, other and, and different shaped nipples. And so there's different things that can affect that, which includes um, tilting the baby's head back and allowing the baby to latch. I have a breast right here to allow, you can actually see my lipstick marks on here, allowing the baby's lower jaw to start first here and then coming over so that the baby is landing that nipple deeper in the mouth rather than up here at the front. This is painful. It also doesn't help the baby remove milk well. No. We need a good latch for not just the mother, but for the intake of the infant as well. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. Latch, getting the latch right solves so many issues. So. 
you know, get help early. Don't wait till, you know, you're five days in and afraid that your baby's going to get hungry and you're going to have to breastfeed them. You know, that's not a, that's not a place where you want to come from, you know? So, you know, get as much help as you can. If you're having a, a hospital birth while you're there, get people, I don't care if you think you're annoying them, bring them in every time it's time to latch baby. Show me again. How do I shape my breast? How do I get the baby on deep? you know, use them while they're there. And yep. when shaping, you're home, shaping helps. See how I'm, I'm going to shape from the side, not in the center, then I'm in the baby's way, but I am to the side like that. I can shape it, make it a little smaller. And then the baby comes here and over the top before I release kind of like eating a burger and it's too fat. You squeeze it down, but you're never in the center of the burger. You're to the side. And then you tilt your head back and your lower jaw goes here first. Yeah. So we teach moms how to do that. And once they get that, it is, they're so excited and, uh, and pretty much leave smiling instead of crying. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking to me. Um, so what are some different breastfeeding positions and how do you figure out which one's the right one for mom and baby? Well, I, it depends on where you are and what you're doing. Like in the hospital, I found particularly with cesarean moms, that the football hold was the most comfortable. Um, but moms eventually all nurse like this. Um, so I, I use more control for the, for, especially if there's a difficult latch. If this is working for you from day one, well, great. Notice though that the position is under the net second breast. There's a nursing pillow out there that platforms babies high. And this is actually the natural kind of position of a mother's arm. So in cross cradle hold, I just trade arms. And I have so much more control of that baby's head. Um, and once the baby gets it, I tell them, you're not even going to look down. You're just going to put the baby in the crook of your arm, open your shirt, and the baby jumps on. But for the early position, this hand here can allow that baby's head to tilt back. And they need to tilt back with chin touching first. And I think it's hard to see with my camera this way, but I can tilt that baby's head back, chin touching. And then my other hand would be here forming the, that teat. And then the baby comes around like this. Football hold is at my side. I've got to have, a, I would have two pillows, hard to show in a chair. And that baby's right up at breast level, right under the breast. I love that hold. And here's my compression. And then when, once I get the baby on, I can roll up um, a blanket or something underneath that baby. So their bottom is just a little lower than their head. So I'm very fond of that position. I find mothers um, do better in that um, at first, and then they transition. So I guess the best one is the one they, they do su successfully and comfortably, uh, but I offer them those options of trying those different positions. Uh, Jennifer, to, uh, to you. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, in the beginning, I find the more structured holds like the cross cradle and the football to be the most helpful because sh you have to support that baby at that base of the neck because they don't have any neck muscles. They can't you know, launch themselves on right away eventually yes but not right away so i feel like the structured holds get that breast shape allow that baby to get on really deep so you don't have a painful latch in a few weeks yeah practice side lay once you side lay in your bed you can you know lay there all day with your baby um but so those, those not, not put your hand here moms don't put your hand here stay yeah. low at, at ear level base of the head um, because if your hand is here a baby will turn away to try to get to the breast you want to stay here and stay off the cheeks because the cheeks make the baby turn to the root reflex makes them turn toward what's touched them so stay back and down as you can see my hand yeah, yeah. and i think like larger breasted women the football hold is a great hold i have fairly large breasts and the football hold for me allowed me a lot more control of because not only not having the baby, I'm having this huge boob as well that I've got to like manage. And the, I find the football hold, you can see everything really clearly and baby's like nice and tucked under your arm. So, you know, depending on anatomy, different positions work better. Okay. But for me, the more structured holds in the beginning. And then of course, like moving on to more laid back positions when you feel comfortable. So I agree with that so much, Jennifer. This this uh, term laid back nursing has become kind of popular. And I saw a lot of difficult latch and painful nipples 
with that attempt. Now, if that works well for you, great, go for it. But it doesn't at first. A lot more structure for many women. Yeah. Yes. I see a lot of like baby led nursing. I'm like, yeah, maybe eventually. But in the beginning, we really need to help baby get on deep. From what I've seen. Me too. That makes sense. Um, so this, I remember being like a crazy concern of mine, but how do you know if baby's getting enough milk, especially in the beginning? Well, that's my specialty. I love talking about that. Um, well, the bottom line is weight gain. And that's been one of the things lately that's been difficult because people yeah. are rushing in and out. So, um, we expect babies to lose weight the first few days of life. So when they leave the hospital and maybe for the first to the fourth day, they're losing. And then uh, the milk is coming in at a higher volume. At, um, so they lose weight and then they stabilize and then they begin to gain. I'll do a few and then Jennifer can pop in on it too. So we wanna see a baby on a normal feeding schedule. So a breastfed baby should be eating eight to 14 times in 24 hours in those early days. Now later on when they're bigger kids, they're gonna spread that out perhaps. And it depends on the mother's milk supply, et cetera, how that goes, but eight to 14 times. Uh, there shouldn't be big long stretches of sleep. They should be getting up and nursing. The longest stretch we should see is three, maybe a one four hour stretch in a 24 hour day. So otherwise they're eating really often. Jennifer, I, I like to teach parents how what swallowing looks like. Yeah, absolutely. So identify non-nutritive sucking and nutritive sucking. And it's important for parents to understand that non-nutritive sucking leads to the nutritive sucking. So we've got to see a lot of that light stroke in order to have then the milk release to the baby. I'll show it with my hand and with my mouth. So when a baby's doing non-nutritive sucking, it's light and fast. When they're doing nutritive sucking, it's more ock, ock, ock. So you see that different rhythm from And you probably couldn't hear the sound I made, but it was there's a little tiny expiratory sound when the baby swallows. So do you see the difference in that rhythm? Yeah. yeah. But to every parent at their bedside or in the office or wherever I can so they can identify, oh my God, the baby's swallowing. And I, I used to say that to a mother, your baby's swallowing. And they'd go, he is. And the father or the partner would be so excited. And then they became involved in, in understanding how to say, oh, look, the baby's swallowing. So... Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. I love when parents are in front of you and the baby's eating because they, you know, look at their jaw. You see how that's moving. If we're quiet, we can hear them. Um, I think in the early days, like day like one through four, until your milk increases in volume, your breast still feels soft and you sort of just have to trust it's going okay. If you're, the void in stool is within normal limits for the day of life of the baby. Breast, baby's getting on, staying actively eating when it's time to eat. Um, you just have to trust it's going good. Once your milk increases in volume, your breasts feel full, you know, oh my gosh, yeah, there is milk there. There is something there. Your baby gets on, they're eating, you hear that swallowing, you see their jaw moving. When they're done, your breasts feel softer. So you're like, well, something must have gone in there because I was really full and now I feel soft. Baby looks satiated, you know, gaining weight, obviously peeing and pooping. If those things are going on, your baby's likely getting what they need from you. So. Yeah. And at some level of satisfaction and some understanding with parents that the babies do have times when they feed every half hour. Absolutely. The parents call it the witching hours. We call it intensive parenting hours or uh, the, the, milk, um, the milk time. I mean, just, uh, and it's not about food. That's what's interesting. Parents think it's all about, I don't have enough milk. And what it really is, is about a baby's wakeful time in a day. And a newborn, so we're the most immature of all placental mammals. Our newborns need to be back in the uterus, if you will. And so what they need to be is in their habitat right here. And their habitat would be on the, on the breast, if at all possible. And they can be on the partner's chest, they can be on grandma's chest, but ultimately they would love to suckle through that period of time as well. Um, many animals do that. They suckle and suckle and suckle. And we are a kind of a species that have 
for some weird reason been told, yeah, it's just 10 to 20 minutes. Right. And then you're out of here. And it's not that way. Babies really need, and I like the word not want, I like the word need, because babies do need that in, uh, in their habitat feeling. How many parents say to us every day, the only place my baby will sleep is right here, which is so difficult for them when the American Academy of Pediatrics is saying never. Um, so we love the sleep belts um, that help keep a baby safe on a parent so that in case they do fall asleep, they could lean back on a couple of pillows. I mean, that's the only place my children slept the first two weeks of their life. And I did it um, in the middle of the bed. So if they did slip, I was there. Uh, there was no way they would get into trouble. Um, but we didn't have rules. My children are very much grown. They didn't have rules like this. Um, I did my co-sleeping on a waterbed, which was profoundly dangerous, but we didn't know. Now we know. And if parents, by the way, there's a book, Ari, that uh, if you could uh, include on the list here, it's the newest book by James McKenna, who is the leading researcher in our country and possibly the world on co-sleeping and sudden infant death. And it's called Safe Infant Sleep. I think it should be required reading before birth. I agree. I recommend that book all the time to people. Too. And the new one just came in on Jan Jan January. It is profound. It will not take a parent or an expectant parent more than two hours to read the applicable parts. Please read the intro, read the, the chapters at the back about why the American Academy made the choice they did to say, don't sleep with your baby when it's not supported by the evidence-based information. But it is, it, it is so important because so many times people do things in a dangerous way without knowing it. Absolutely. It isn't meant to teach you that you should sleep with your baby, but all the ins and outs about it and how to be safe in every way and when you shouldn't. And I mean, there's really a slave, safe sleep seven. We, so get this book. My God, you got to read this book. Um, no matter what you choose to do, even though you may say, I'm never going to do that. You haven't felt the exhaustion or the fact that your baby's content here. Right. Uh, this, and so do it and make it do what's safe. Um, and so read the book and make the choices. Uh, yeah. So we just uh, are too afraid and the hospitals won't let you say anything. So you have to be, you have to be aware that, that there are uh, some safe things you, well, you just need to get educated. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there, and he has a website, um, and that would be if somebody wants to catch the, the quickie. He also is on a website called kidsinthehouse.com. So um, anyway, and, and you, I just want everybody to know, even if you don't sleep with your baby, even the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends near you for the first six to 12 months, for sure six months, in your room next to you. So McKenna actually says, um, in, within arm's reach. Yes. So, that uh, and that's number like five on on how to prevent SIDS is having your baby next to you, uh, mm -hmm. but on your same surface, certainly in in a place in, within arm's reach. So I specifically remember being in the hospital and the nurse being like, "You can hold the baby if you're tired." And my hut and then the nurse left the room and my husband was like, "Aren't we always going to be tired? Are we never supposed to hold the baby?" <laughs> <laughs> Silly. Remember that conversation? Yeah. Okay. Back to breastfeeding. <laughs> um, I wanted to move on to pumping. Um, we kind of touched on it before, but I know that there's a bunch of different ways to feed a baby. Um, in the beginning, you can exclusively breastfeed, you can exclusively pump, you can do a combination. Um, can you just explain the differences between all the different feeding options? Yeah, I mean, you can choose to feed your baby however you would like. If your goal is to be breastfeeding, and there's no medical indication that you need to start pumping and supplementing, I would recommend exclusively breastfeeding for the first two to four weeks. Get your breastfeeding going well before you need to pump and start introducing a bottle. But you know, babies come in all different shapes and sizes and age ranges. So there might be times when maybe a baby was born early like premature that you would need to start pumping right away and you know maybe wait for the baby to grow into the breastfeeding but you know depending on your goal you know would determine how you decide to feed your baby from the beginning so i would add to that um one of the reasons we would recommend exclusive breastfeeding for the first at least two weeks is that um, babies will preference to a bottle if uh, given a lot of bottles. And we, I get it that there are sometimes that there's no choice, but of course you do the bottle. 
um, if you can help it, don't introduce the bottle until at least two weeks. Let breastfeeding get well established. And then we would, if all at all possible, keep that bottle to one a day yeah. or three times a week. Um, and, and I get life out there happens. It happened to you, Ari, um, that sometimes there's a need for more. But if you can not do that, it, it will help the baby not preference to the bottle. The other issue is also true. Babies will not take a bottle if they get all breast. And it depends on how old the baby is and who they are. Some babies will take anything from anybody anytime, but others are pretty particular. And I've got two moms in my support group right now whose babies will not take a bottle. Yeah. And so we've got kind of both issues to be concerned about, but uh, exclusive pumping from, I've had mothers want to do that from the beginning. And honest to God, we would support those women in whatever they choose to do for whatever reason. But I've, I've seen women who thought that's what they wanted to do, but gave breastfeeding a try and ended up liking the, doing that too. And down the road, there's a lot of combinations of everything. So we're, we, I can tell Jennifer would be the same as I, and that is we try to give you the information and support your choices and I think that's our role uh, to do that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think like women, you know, obviously do things for different reasons, depending on who they are and what happened to in their life. Some women that come in that think I want to exclusively pump because I want to see exactly how much the baby's getting each feeding, maybe more education of here's other signs like the ones we talked about how you could tell breastfeeding's going well and what your baby's getting and so once you alleviate that stress that they have like how will i know that they're getting anything you know then that allows them to let go of the control of needing to pump which you know is really not that fun <laughs> <laughs> well, I've pumped in airplanes. I've pumped on airport yeah. in airports. I've pumped in the car while I've been driving. It's like, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a commitment well, for sure. Yeah. So I mean, we give them the education and then, you know, ask deeper questions. Well, why do you feel like you know exclusive pumping is going to be what you do? Or you know, different cultures do different things. I'm I'm I meet people where they're at and give them the tools so they can make the best choice moving forward that's easiest. And then also just talking about babies not taking a bottle. A lot of women, I wouldn't say a lot, but you know, a number of them will say, well, I'm always gonna be with my baby, so I don't need to give them a bottle. In my opinion, that's great. You're gonna be with your baby, but I always think it's a good idea to have a baby take a bottle, introduce a bottle, you don't have to give one every day, but certainly three days, four days a week. It's very stressful when a baby won't take a bottle and you may not be going back to work, but life gets in the way. You may have to get stuck in traffic or you may want to go out or you may have some illness that takes you away from the baby. And when the baby won't so, take a bottle, it's stressful for you, it's stressful for the baby, it's stressful for whoever's taking care of the baby. So I think it's important that babies know how to take a bottle. I think it's wise, and I agree with her, once a day is the most, uh, unless you've got some situation that you have to do, a job interview or a wedding or something. But overall, if babies take too many bottles, they'll refuse the breast and vice versa, so yeah. I heard that um, when you're introducing the bottle, you should have someone other than the mom do it. Is that true? It depends to me. Uh, my husband was a resident when I had my first baby. He wasn't home. Yeah. I mean, I just think it's a circumstance. And I think down the road, I think the mother does better. If a baby's refusing a bottle down the road, but boy, there's, we have a list online about things to help a baby take a bottle. But for everything we say, the opposite works for some babies. That's I agree. Yeah. It's either like... If a baby it refuses a bottle, it's like recreate the breastfeeding experience for that baby or do the complete opposite. Every, yeah. every baby is, they're a person, they're different, yeah. so. Some like it cold, some like it hot. Some yeah. want it exactly 98.6, some want it yeah. icy. And but yeah, I don't find that moms introducing a bottle to baby has ever been a problem. I've certainly mm -hmm. heard, oh, mom needs to leave the house. It needs to be, you know, this, dad or whatever a partner but no i've had moms just as easily introduce a bottle as anybody else i think the key is not waiting too long you know when babies are open to oh yeah sure i'll do that 
We do a lot of side feeding too. So we try to teach parents how to pace feed. So meaning that it's, it's coming a little bit slow. I and mean, we recommend the slow flow nipples. Um, particularly, we have a couple that we like the most. Um, but every baby's a bit different. And the one they take is the one we, um, that they take slowly. Because if, so it depends on the mother too. We have mothers that have such fast flow and we have mothers that have slow flow, but we really like to pace those bottles. OTs feed babies on their side. Occupational therapists, I don't know if you can see this, they hold babies more on their side and feed this way, which is less stressful than this. And we would never feed a baby straight down, but always elevated and then just pace that bottle. So he's not getting anything uh, for a minute and then it can come back up. And then down because the breast ebbs and flows. It doesn't pour constantly. It doesn't have milk every stroke. So remember, we talked about non nutritive and nutritive sucking. There's episodic times um, when the baby is not taking milk very much, and then she gets another burst, and then not much, and then another burst. Same with the pumps. I'm working with moms all the time online how to use their pumps better, that they shouldn't stay on that second rhythm the whole time. That's why they have a toggle ability to go back to the what they call the letdown, or uh, Spectra calls it massage. They need to go back to that phase when their milk stops flowing and have it come again. So I'm working with moms on the efficiency of their pumps as well. Yeah, I, yeah and I, I also think with bottle feeding, it's important that parents know how much milk a baby actually needs at a certain age. You know, I think in this country, certainly we're used to seeing you know, giant bottles full of, you know, white liquid and people think, oh, that's what a baby needs. They, they really, it's like at one month, their stomach's still tiny. They don't. And there's so much overfeeding in our culture. And the thing like, come on, finish that bottle. And yeah, I'm always like, don't be like, just, there's a little left, keep going. And so um, there's a tendency is they take it all in five minutes. So gosh, they must need more and in comes more. We see 10 ounce bottles on the market. Yeah, that's um, never necessary. So we're um, urging parents to use their bottles, um, I guess, in a, in a slow way, slow, slow bottles. So we're big fans of, of, every bottle seems to say they are slow flow, but that's not what the evidence supports. So I, I, you try drink, I tell them, I say, try drinking out of it. Is it coming out fast? You know? Hold it upside down. Is it dripping? Yeah. yeah. So we like Dr. Brown with the preemie nipple is one of our favorites. Um, and the preemie nipple now comes on all their sizes. And when do you switch? For me, you switch. I had a mom this week whose baby now is taking forever to take the preemie and collapsing the nipple. So that's when you move up to level one. It's not a month thing. Right. Some babies will never come off preemie nipple. So, yeah. But we like some others as well. And, it, you know, we tell moms not to buy. There's a pack you can buy on the internet of a bunch of different kinds in there. I would not do that. That's like seven or eight bottles. I would pick two or three that one of us recommended and see what your baby likes and, and save money. Don't buy all that, all that. right, Jennifer? I agree. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we kind of touched on it, but I think it's a big confusion or a big concern for new moms um, is nip, nipple confusion. So you, you mentioned introducing bottles like two, three weeks. Is it the same for pacifiers or? Are pacifiers kind of scary for breastfeeding? Well, I don't really call anything nipple confusion. It's flow preference, like Corky was saying. Yeah. Bottles are easy. Babies get used to that fast flow of the bottles. So when they start getting the majority of bottle, they come over to the breast and they're like, wait, what? why do I have to keep working to get this out? Bottles just kind of flow. So it's really flow preference. In terms of the pacifier for me, I try to say, I say a few things, which, you know, maybe disagree, whatever. We live in LA. There's not traffic right now, but certainly when there's traffic and people are driving an hour to the pediatrician and their baby's screaming, would I use a pacifier in the early days? Probably, or I'd use my finger. Um, aside of that, if your baby in the early days is wanting to suck, put them on your breast. I also don't want you to miss your baby's feeding cues because they're busy sucking on a pacifier. You don't notice they're actually hungry. So if you can hold off the first couple weeks, get your breastfeeding going well, and you want to use a pacifier, you know, go for it. But if baby keeps spitting it out, feed them or don't keep trying to put it back in. 
So I don't disagree with that. However, um, I also think, and she's not doing this, so I'm not criticizing Jennifer. I think there's too many rules. Yeah. yeah. Negative rules. And I think that there are babies on this planet. I, I myself actually went into the nursery when I was on, on in the hospital and got pacifiers for a few babies now and then that they were just on the breast continually. The mom needed a break and the dad, and they felt so relieved that they could just do that. I got accused of being, I'm, I won't even use the term, it was so negative. But I'm, I need a pacifier for this baby in 109. And um, they said, aren't you the breastfeeding consultant? I said, yeah, this baby still needs a pacifier. And babies pop it out because their tongue moves on a horizontal plane, like that, in and out. So they pop it out. Don't, you know, do something else. If they need it for a few minutes while mom's in the shower, you know, do that. Um, yeah. Talk about how to survive the, the uh, three hour witching hour and dad's on the yoga ball doing the bounce and maybe his fingers in the baby's mouth while mom grabs a bite to eat. So I think we just say be minimal, um, it, get the best milk established, but it's not like, oh my God, are you evil? You're using a pacifier. We're not like that. Maybe I wouldn't have passed my exam with a, a good score, Jennifer. Had I, I mean, I know what the talk is. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, know say so be, be mindful of it. Yeah, we're in a real world here um, where people need um, to have uh, not feel guilty about every damn thing. Whoops, did I swear? Yeah, because there's so many people putting so much pressure on parents. And you, you, when you're in a support group and you hear every mother say, I'm worried about, they worry and stress and they feel guilty. It's the gift that never stops giving to them. And so we try to relieve that by saying, look, be minimal, but if you need to use it, and we do like certain kinds. We like the kind formed out of one piece. that They don't have a lot of saliva and bacteria growth in those. But, you know, here's the deal. Use the one that the baby takes. Um, uh, so that's kind of where we sit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree. And I don't think using a pacifier is going to make your baby not breastfeed. I don't either. Yeah. So I don't, yeah, I don't know that nipple confusion is really... We, it, I also it, use the same term. word she does. I use flow preference, not nipple confusion. Yeah, flow preference, exactly. So we just have a few minutes left. Um, is there any? Oh, no, we want to talk a long time. <laughs> I, know, I could talk about this forever. I like to bring me back. Um, <laughs> is there any final things that you want to make sure that new moms know that are um, embarking on the breastfeeding journey and want to be successful? Uh, I would just say... Um, you know, we give moms guidelines in the beginning, right? Make sure the baby eats every three hours and, you know, this, this, and this. I think it, it somehow, sometimes does a disservice because they think, oh, I don't, my, my baby only eats every three hours. Like I breastfeed them, I swaddle them, they go to sleep for three hours, then I get up and I feed them and then I swaddle them and they go to sleep. That is not really happening. So I think I always tell people, um, be prepared to hold your baby like 20 out of every 24 hours. You know, your baby's really not away from you. It's spending the majority of the time in your arms or someone else's arms. In, and there's not, it's not wrong that they want to eat all the time. I think that people are like, well, my baby wants to eat all the time. What, what, what's the problem? No, they're here for many reasons, not just eating. So I think if we were more realistic about what to expect those first few weeks, um, and I try to be, you know, when I teach classes and stuff, but I think people don't uh, expect the uh, amount of exhaustion that comes along with it and second guessing why isn't my baby sleeping for three hours you know you said th every three hours so I think just being more uh, mindful on how we tell parents what really goes on the first couple weeks is would be good to add to what Jennifer said at least every three hours so yeah. it's, there, it could be every half hour at times um, and that what to look, I like parents to know kind of what to look for, but most of all, I'd like them to know that it's worth the effort and that to get help uh, right from the start, even if that's just a person to talk to, um, you know, there's places like ours around the country. Uh, there's places like where Jennifer and I work. Um, the pump station and nursery is open seven days a week at some level. And we are open with things out the back door. We will rent you a pump that's clean and washed down. 
Um, and even some doctors are sending our babies over to come in the back door and get a weight check and we clean the scale and then they go back out. There is help. We will talk to you. Don't sit alone and think that you're an idiot at home because it's not going well. It is amazingly difficult for many people. And I think it's a, a disservice if lactation people or anybody makes it sound like, oh, just stick them up there, they latch and we go. It's not that way. And you will be exhausted. And it is, um, it is an around the clock job. So during pregnancy, moms get a lot of attention. Uh, and But when the baby's born, now the baby, it switches. She feels like a dumpster. Uh, she's exhausted. She needs such positive support around her, somebody to bring her a drink of water, somebody, and you know, COVID has changed things in a way that might make that more difficult, but um, we talk to the partners all the time about just tell her how cute the baby is and what a great job she's doing. So a lot of positive input and some strategies if she is struggling so um, that she can be, uh, understand that other women struggle too. It is absolutely, and uh, Ari, you could give a lecture on this part. Um, so that's the support groups are not just for problems. It's also for people who could share and have community. There needs to be community around new motherhood. Absolutely. All the way it's always been until right now. So we want to provide that even virtually for them. So hang with it. It's worth the effort. And I remember I had a comedian come one time to the support group in Hollywood and she dragged in her pillows and all her junk and she flopped herself down and said, if I have to keep this up, I'm just, and by the end of the class, we were all howling with laughter. And one mother looked at her and she said, you know, um, you don't have to like it, but it's important. And I love that. She taught the whole class right in that one sentence. And then she went on to say, and I bet you will like it sooner than later. Yeah. A lot of moms will say that at eight or 20 weeks, we're starting to really relax into this and enjoy it. You need to just give it a, a bit of time. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I came to your support group with my first son. I didn't have any breastfeeding problems. I just needed friends and community. You yeah. Know? And still have those friends. I, I love them. We all had second kids together. They, a lot of us still go to the like, same schools. So. so I'm at the pump station in Nurtury, Santa Monica, California. Um, uh, and they will happily give you my phone number or they'll text me and tell me to call you. And I will. So Jennifer? Yeah, and you can uh, reach me at my website, which will have my phone number, and it's milkmadela.com. Or and if you're giving birth at Kaiser, any of the Kaisers, you can call our lactation clinic. Um, the 800 number of Kaiser will give that to you. And our website is pumpstation.com, and honestly, there is tons of information there. So many other topics, and we have lots of online classes. If you're still pregnant, we have from childbirth to uh, introducing solids and many other things, even grandparents' classes. So, you know, join us. We'd love to have you and stay well. Well, thank you both so much for your time and being such incredible resources. Um, I know this is like a really important topic for so many new moms and a, and a tough one, um, which you never expect, but it is.